How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Doing well? Great. You shouldn't be. You guys should be very upset with what's going on this year. You're very optimistic. I like that. That's, that's the nature of farmers, right? You, we all hope for better things next year. We realize this year is not going to work out too well, but we're very hopeful for next year. What I'm going to be talking to, to you about this morning, something near, very near and dear to my heart, it's soul fertility. Uh, just a little bit of a background on me and who I am. For, for those of you, everybody ever heard of that guy, Robert Mullen? That's good. I found a new audience. I have all my old jokes will work again. Uh, I, I used to be a, an associate professor at The Ohio State, and I don't take that wrong. I'm not a, I don't like the the in front of it. I don't know why they ever did that. I just like to say that as a joke. Uh, I was an associate professor there for seven years. Uh, 2011, last June, had an opportunity to join industry, uh, an opportunity to join Potash Corporation. How many have ever heard of Potash Corp, PCS? Okay, everybody, if you buy nitrogen, actually we don't sell much nitrogen here in the U.S. We sell a lot of our nitrogen uh, as an export. A lot of that goes offshore. But if you're buying PNK, you're, you're probably buying it from either us or Mosaic in this part of the world. Okay. So we are a primary producer of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So it's, it's actually quite appropriate today that what I'm going to be talking about is P and K on soybeans. Now, <clears throat> kind of threw this together last second. I knew what I wanted to talk about, and then I realized I had PowerPoint, so I went ahead and threw together a presentation. So we'll, we'll see where this leads us. But I'm hoping what you're going to take out of this today is some of this is going to be refreshers, specifically some of the stuff on the front end. And it's, it's purposeful that I do that. All right, I, I want to remind you about some of the basics of soil fertility as it relates to P and K management. Because sometimes I, it, it's always nice to have that refresher course. Sometimes we forget some of those old concepts that maybe an old university guy or an old industry guy used to talk about. And it's, it really lays the groundwork for where I want to go this, this morning. And oh, by the way, you're the most unlucky group in here unless you finish up in the next room. Because this likely means you're going to be outside this afternoon. So take full advantage of the air conditioner. I, I don't mean go to sleep. But, but, but certainly enjoy the cool air because I know I will for the rest of the day. I'm, I'm not going to be sweating all that much. Whenever I give a presentation, I always like to start with a general overview. What am I going to be covering today? Just to, to let you know up front what we're going to be talking about and you can sort of hold me true to this as I go through. And, and the other thing, we, we've got about 45 minutes. We're a fairly small group. If you have questions at any time, then we're not going to do questions post. If you have a question at any point in the presentation, stop me. I'm, I'm much more interested in having a conversation with you than I am presenting information, okay? Because at the end of the day, what's ultimately of importance to you is how do you improve your operation, okay? So stop me at any point as we're traveling through. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to move through some very basic soil concepts. I'm not going to bore you with chemistry. Well, I might bore you a little bit, and for that I apologize, but it's important to this discussion. I'm going to talk about critical levels. I'm, I'm going to talk about soil testing and how these universities come up with these critical levels that they've established. And we can cuss and discuss about the reliability of those critical levels. Are they appropriate for today's hybrids, for today's varieties that we're out there planting, the higher yield potentials? I've got my own perspective based upon my own experience being a researcher at Ohio State. So I, I'm more than happy to have that conversation. All right. Now, what's, that's interesting stuff. but really what it comes down to is your fertilizer dollar in, what kind of a decision are you going to make with regard to fertility? Specifically talking about P and K. I think there's going to be some opportunities throughout the day to talk about micronutrient nutrition. Uh, all I'm going to be talking about is P and K nutrition. All right. And then the economics of those considerations. I don't know if you guys saw this recently in the news, but fertilizer prices have gone up a little from say a decade ago. How, how many remember, I still remember, $1.85 a ton potash. That was what we commonly refer to as the good old days. Uh, being an individual that works for a primary producer and, and seeing the marketplace and seeing the fact that we haven't had a greenfield expansion, when I say greenfield expansion, we haven't sunk a new shaft for a mine in over 20 years. Does that sound like the oil industry? <laughs> That's an interesting point of discussion. We don't have a lot of new, new material coming online, primarily because of the cost. It's $7 billion to sink a new shaft. So that's not a small investment. So as you look globally at what's going on, what's going on in Brazil, what's going on in China, what's going on in India? They're ramping up agronomic production. Guess what? They're not competing with you for primary nutrients for production. 
And that's the primary reason that prices have gone up. Okay? So if you want to have a discussion along those lines, we can have that conversation as well. But just to sort of share with you where we are, but at the end of the day, again, that's interesting information, but how does, it, how does that impact your decisions? We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about economics. So some very basic, so how many have ever seen something similar to this? It's, it's basically a, a, a diagram that illustrates where potassium or phosphorus go in the soil. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. All I really want you to make you aware of is this large area in the middle, what I call solution P. And I suspect you all know this, but the only fraction of phosphorus that a plant can actually utilize is the fraction that's actually in water. How do plants take up nutrients? It's the primary mechanism, through the roots. How do the nutrients get from the soil to the roots? With water, okay? This is why soil testing is critical. We want to have some estimate of just how much of the nutrient held in that soil can be adsorbed it can be, be precipitated into various mineral fractions. I'm, again, I'm not going to bore you with chemistry. Some of it's going to be contained in the organic material. Realize what we're trying to supplement with fertilizer, whether that's commercial forms, something you're going to buy from your local retailer, or if you're, you happen to live in close proximity or perhaps you are an animal producer, you have access to manure. Ultimately, what is your goal? It's to increase the amount of phosphorus that you have in solution to a level that's enough to satisfy crop nutritional need. That really sounds simple, doesn't it? Well, unfortunately, with things like phosphorus specifically, it does everything it possibly can chemically to get out a solution. How many are frustrated by this? I know as a chemist and as a soil fertility guy, this frustrates me. But this is the reality of the system. If I supply fertilizer, some's going to be absorbed, some's going to be precipitated. That's going to decrease the total amount that I have in solution. So what do we have to do with fertilization? What, do we, what have we done historically? Well, we usually oversupply it, so we satisfy these and increase the amount that's here. It's basically what we've done, okay? Potassium doesn't look as sophisticated. Potassium, to be really honest with you, I like potassium. Maybe that's why I work for a company called Potash Corp. The reason I like potassium, because its chemical nature is fairly simplistic. Now, we, we still have to, to deal with some of this material getting out of solution. We have exchangeable K, we have adsorption. Some of that material that is absorbed can actually be occluded or put into a form that's not actually available to a crop. I want to talk a little bit about that because you see this a lot in dry years. Okay, and I, I, do want to, I do want to cover that very briefly because how many guys have seen a lot of potassium stress this year? Okay, how many saw it last year on your corn? I, I know working at Ohio State University for the past seven years, the last three years of my career there, I got more calls on potassium deficiency than I, than I did my first four. Okay, and I think I have a couple of reasons for that. Some of it is environmentally related. But then some of it is, I, I'm not sure that we're keeping up with our fertilization rates. And I, I do want to cover that. So again, our ultimate goal is to increase the amount of material in solution to satisfy crop nutritional need. That's the reason we fertilize. What have you often heard about P and K nutrition? Are P and K mobile? Do they move great distances in soil? No, if you've had a class on plant physiology and they talked a little bit about soils, or you've had a soil science class, an introductory soil science class, and you talked at all about crop nutrition or nutrient movement, they probably told you that these nutrients don't move very far. In fact, we call them immobile. This is just a simple illustration of that concept. Now, it, it is influenced by soil texture, right? Because if you think about a sandy material, what do we know about sands? Very coarse textured, don't have a lot of clay. What's responsible for holding nutrients, specifically cations like potassium? The clay material. So if I have very little clay material and I have a lot of coarse textured material that's not holding much, realize that if, if I have a decent amount of sand that's only 4% clay, this material can move fairly far from the root, a, a whole six millimeters. Nobody got that. That's a long distance, by the way, in a soil for potassium. Well, what about a clayey soil? If everybody, anybody ever traveled to Northwest Ohio, Northeastern Indiana? What did that area used to be? You, you know what that used to be, I don't know, 120 years ago, 130 years ago? A swamp. <laughs> Do you think their soils drain real well? No, why not? Because they got a lot of clay. Well, does that influence how far a material can move? Yeah, it can only move about two millimeters. This is potassium. Phosphorus moves even less. 
Okay? Just an illustration of the point that that is a correct concept. These nutrients, specifically in a soil that has a decent texture, higher CEC, what are your typical CECs in this part of the world? From what I've seen soil test, 18 to 22. You're going to have some swings. You're going to, there are some sandy pockets. I don't know if you guys knew that. There are some sandier soils here in the state of Illinois. They're in smaller pockets than what we have to deal with in, say, northeastern Indiana, southern Michigan. Okay. A lot of your soils tend to be closer to a silty clay loam or a silt loam. So you got some decent CECs. On those types of soils, the nutrients that we require for, for crop nutrition, they're not going to move very far. Okay. This is why when we think about crop nutrition, why it's so important, or this is even why soil testing even works. Let me ask this question. I always ask this. How many think soil testing works? <laughs> Boy, that's a loaded question. Okay, when you think about it, how many cores do you collect? 20 cores, maybe for 20 acres. Every state has a different recommendation. I'm not sure what University of Illinois or, or what NRCS here in Illinois recommends. So you're taking 20 cores from a 20 acre area. How much soil have you collected in mass? Pound and a half, maybe. Pound and a half of soil. Does anybody know what soil weighs to a depth of six inches over an acre? Two million pounds. Multiply that by 20. 40 million pounds. You collected a pound and a half of soil to represent 40 million pounds. Let me ask the question again. How many think soil testing works? I still do. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Okay. All we're attempting to do with soil test is represent the average of the field. And to represent an average, I don't have to survey the entire field. I just have to survey a portion of the field. We're, in the, we're getting ready, and it seems like we started this last summer. We're in an election cycle. Again, I don't know if you heard that. I suspect you're getting bombarded every night like I am with political ads on television. When we go to polls, or when they do polling, anybody ever been called for a poll? Okay, there's usually at least a couple in an audience. Well, then, are those polls accurate at all? <laughs> we can certainly question them. But it gives us a pretty good idea of, of where the, the electorate lies. Just how many people are going to go red, how many are going to go blue. It's not perfect, but it gives us a pretty good idea. That's what soil testing is. Okay? But because these nutrients don't move far within soil, it works. Do you have a really good test for nitrogen? For, like, for coming up with a nitrogen recommendation for corn? Not, not really. Why? Nitrogen's mobile, man. It moves with water. And it's very strongly related to yield potential. The higher the yield, the higher the nitrogen requirement is. P and K, nice thing about them being immobile. The higher the yield, the amount that's required in the soil is the same, regardless of what the yield potential is. Does that, now, now don't misunderstand, does that mean the fertilization rate won't, won't change as yields go up? It's not what that means. Because what happens with higher yields, and I'm getting way ahead of myself, I think I'm pretty much wrapping up the presentation right now. What happens with higher yields? Oh, more higher nutrient removal. Higher nutrient removal, I'm mining more of that, that soil for that material, that, those nutrients that are required. If I don't replenish that at some point, what's going to happen to the amount available in the soil? It's going to start coming down. Okay, I'm going I'm to show you some of that information. Since I talked about this, I'm, I'm not going to spend any time. This is very conceptual plant physiology stuff. So thinking about soil, and this, I promise these next two slides will be the end of the chemistry. Uh, everything from here on in will be very simple math. Exchangeable K. Just to give you an idea of what this concept looks like. Clays, we often represent it as a two-dimensional structure, right? You've, I don't know if I can write on this. We'll see. Is it going to show up over here, I hope? Hey, looky there. This is very strange because I don't know what I'm, where I'm at. Hey, I'm actually pretty good at this. Okay. How many have ever seen something like this to represent a clay and soil and cation exchange and potassium sorb to cation exchange? Never seen that. This is textbook stuff. This is what we often talk about. But realize clays are three-dimensional structures. So they've got edges, and then they've got areas between clay particles, right? Because clays can't aggregate. 
And to be honest, we'd prefer them to aggregate. If you have a bunch of dispersed clays out there, you're not going to be a very productive farmer. We like it when clays aggregate. Well, what happens when we start getting dry? So we have potassium here on the edges, so this is what's in solution, okay? Not, maybe not the best representation, a little bit confusing. This is actually what's in solution, this is what the plant can use. So when the plant removes this potassium from solution, the root takes it up, some of the potassium that's held on this clay material actually goes out to resupply what was there. Okay, it's what we call chemical equilibria. Pretty cool stuff. Some of this material from inside the clays can actually float back out and re replenish what's been removed by the crop. Okay, well, what happens when soil's dry? You guys have any shrink swell soils over here? Just as a joke, I grew up in Oklahoma, the southwestern part of the state. A lot of Montmorillonitic soils. A defining feature of a Montmorillonitic soil is when it gets dry, it shrinks quite a bit. And our joke was, you know it's been dry when you see a coyote loping across the field and you turn around and he's gone. Where'd he go? He fell in a crack. That's when you know it's been dry in Oklahoma. My guess is you could probably say the same joke in Illinois. Well, what happens to the potassium that's held between those clay particles when the clay shrink? So this is a, this is a clay where you've got potassium. That's the, what we call the hydrated radius. We're not going to be concerned with that. This potassium can actually be flushed out to resupply what the plant needs. Well, what happens as the soil dries, going from right to left? What happens to the clay? Collapses. What happens to the potassium trapped in the clays? They're, not, they're no longer available to the plant. They're not going to get the opportunity to move from the clay out into soil solution. Why do you suspect you see more potassium stress when it's dry? It's actually another reason beyond this one. If you have limited water supply, what's your primary mechanism of delivering nutrients to a plant? Water. If you don't have water flowing to the root, do you think you're going to see much in the way of nutrient uptake? Unfortunately, it's a... It's a <laughs> It gets worse and worse and worse the drier it gets because water's not moving. The water that is moving because of this phenomenon, I'm not getting as much K in solution to supply the plant. The plant's not getting as much water. This is why you see a lot of drought stress, potassium deficiency related to drought stress. This is exactly why. Now, could we combat this to a degree? We can. How can we do that? Increase potassium supply. You're not going to overcome I don't care how much P, how much K, in this kind of growing environment that we've had this year, regardless of what you've done, you can help some by making sure you have adequate nutrition. But if the, the spigot turns off completely, we all know you're pretty much dead in the water at that point. Okay? But if we get into those scenarios where it's, we get these dry stretches, if we have maintained an adequate soil potassium supply, I can actually ensure that I have, even if the water is not flowing at a, as a high a volume as I would like, as long as I can keep the K nutrition up, I can actually help that plant. Does anybody know why? Why is potassium so important? Specifically as it relates to, to drought stress and dry periods. Has anybody ever heard of stomates? Uh, the small, they're microscopic. You can't really see them on the leaf structure. The, it's essentially the place where gas exchange occurs with the leaf. How does a plant take up carbon dioxide? It's, that's its only carbon source. Where does it get it from? It comes out of the atmosphere. How does it get into the plant? Through these small openings, these stomates. Well, stomates also have another feature. They control transpiration. We all know what transpiration is. What is transpiration? I like to throw around these big terms and just operate as if everybody understands them. Transpiration is water loss. Exactly. It's water loss from the leaf. Why in the world would a plant want to lose water? Ah, very good. I didn't expect that answer. But it is a cooling response. Okay, because if it loses water, it can dissipate its temperature. Okay, why else does a plant lose water? There's a big reason plants lose water. This is why transpiration is absolutely critical. Plants do two things. They harvest sunlight and they're always moving water to the roots. Always, always, always. That's what they're out there doing. How do they do that? Transpiration. They actually lose water so the roots can actually pull water from the soil. Okay? This is why adequate potassium nutrition is so critical because 
What controls the, the aperture size or the size of this opening? It's the guard cells. What controls guard cell activity? Potassium. So when we have adequate potassium nutrition, we actually see lower transpiration rates. Do you think a lower transpiration rate is a good thing when we're getting into a dry period? Yeah, because that plant's actually able to conserve more water to allow it to get through that dry period better. The other thing that we notice, improved potassium nutrition, specifically during dry stretches, greater photosynthetic activity. This is why potassium is so important and why it's critical in dry periods. When we look at crop responses to potassium, when do you think we really see the benefit of K? In a tougher growing environment. I'll show you some of that data. When I have dry stretches during a growing season that result in some fairly significant yield decreases in both corn and beans, where I really see the benefit of potassium is in that tougher growing environment. Specifically if it's related to poor water availability. All right. You've all seen this. I'll just flash this up here really quickly. Potassium deficiency. Sometimes it's confused with nitrogen. The primary difference is where it occurs on the leaf. So potassium stress is always going to begin from the leaf tip. It's going to proceed towards the base of the, the, base of the leaf on the lower leaves, but it's going to go along the margins. What happens if it proceeds along the midrib, sort of as a V towards the base? What is that? That's nitrogen deficiency. Okay. Some people do confuse these. Soybean plant, it looks very similar. Now, we often say potassium stress shows up on the lower leaves, in the lower canopy. Not always true. You can see potassium stress on some of the new growth, some of the new leaves. This is just a simple illustration of that. But as it proceeds and deficiency gets worse, it actually goes again from the tip to the base, proceeding along the leaf margin. So I'd mentioned before about fertilizer rates, and I actually wanted to put this later in the presentation, but didn't have a chance to do that. We've actually done some calculations. Uh, this is actually my own attempt to do these calculations. There's another group, International Plant Nutrition Institute, that's doing something very similar, looking at nutrient balances at different geographic scales. So they're doing it at a watershed level. That's way too much data for me. Uh, I mean, I could do it, but I don't have the time to do it. So I just did this on state level basis for all 50 states in the US, based upon USDA information. Uh, I've taken into account everything that they report. They don't report much on fruits and veggies, which frustrates me. But, but I can't do anything about that. So when we look at the balances for phosphorus, this is just for the state of Illinois. So P205 removal. These are the, the I guess I would call it an off-white diamond. The blue triangle is P205 fertilizer application. Now that is not just commercial fertilizer. That is also manure generated, based upon some assumptions. And then P205 is the balance. Where is the balance moving? You guys have a pretty good appreciation for this. I don't really have to put up a sophisticated slide. What have yields done since the mid-70s? Okay. With the exception of the last two years. So this is what it looked like. Now this is what it looks like. <laughs> that, that's what happens in three years consecutive when you're below trend line yields. It's, just, it's actually pretty close. So beans have done this. Corn has done this. Now, Obviously, the bulk of the yield that we've, we've achieved increases have been with corn. Corn's increasing about 1.4% per year. Beans are only about 1.1. What's happened with fertilizer rates? With your fertilizer rates, have they gone up to match as yields have increased? No, we actually have the commercial fertilizer data. And oh, by the way, you have fewer animals in this state than you did back in the 60s and 70s. So fertilizer rates look like this. So does it surprise you that the balance in the last decade has started to turn negative? It shouldn't. Yields are higher, more crop removal. We're not necessarily supplying as much fertilizer. We don't have as many animals available in the state to supply fertilizer. So it doesn't surprise us that the balance is negative. Can we get away with this forever? Unfortunately, we can't. Okay, at some point, we can get away with this for a while because when you look back at the data from the 60s and 70s, does anybody, some of you guys remember those days, the good old days. What was, what was fertilizer nitrogen for crying out loud? A nickel a pound? What was P and K? Nitrogen was the expensive one, by the way. What did we do with fertilizer rates back then? Man, don't ever come up short. So do you think we oversupplied a little bit, 60s, 70s? Yeah, I think there's a really good argument for that. Based upon the nature of P and K, if I oversupply, do I lose it? Nope. Remember when I showed that diagram of P and K in soil? I just supply enough to satisfy what 
the soil wants, and then I can increase the amount that's in solution. So over time, I can get away with not supplying if I way oversupplied years ago. Think we can do this forever indefinitely? Unfortunately, we can't. But this is where we're headed. Potassium doesn't look as bad. And my guess is because historically potassium has, has been the cheaper source of fertilizer compared to phosphorus. But we are starting, we are noticing this trend of declining balance. Now, the other thing I will tell you about these charts, this is probably an underestimation of what's actually going on because I assume, and you, get, you guys tell me if this is a bad assumption or not, I assume that manure nutrients have a really good distribution. <laughs> That's really a bad assumption, but I really have no way to deal with it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a way to, if I get it at a smaller geographic scale, I can do better. But at state level, I just assume that all the nutrients that are produced from animal production are getting distributed across the state pretty well. And I know that's a bad assumption. So this, it actually makes this look better than it really is. Okay. So this is where we're headed. Now, that should have been like one of the next to last slides. How much time, when do we officially stop here? 40 after? Uh, 9.30. 9.30. All right, doing pretty good. I do have this for Illinois, by the way. And if, if you don't believe me, I can show you. I, th I thought this is what I was going to be working from today. Didn't mean to go backwards. You have something very similar here in the state of Illinois. Okay, I thought I'd save the file. Apparently I didn't. So I couldn't build that slide. So what I'm going to have to use is Iowa State. I know, minus five for the presenter. Don't ever talk about other state information when you're in the state of Illinois. I get the same thing when I travel to, to Iowa when I talk about Illinois data. Or when I'm in Ohio when I talk about Iowa or Illinois data. Fair? That's fair. But what I'm illustrating here you're going to see from, from most of the land grant universities. So what am I showing you? This is soil test P level. And remember, soil testing isn't perfect. I'm never going to portray that it is. But it gives you a fairly good idea of where your average soil test level is. Bray P1 soil test, Bray P1 soil test, bean response, corn response. What happens if you're at a really low soil test level? What does the University of Illinois establish as critical? It is a function of your soil. Okay, if you have a good subsoil with a good phosphorus supply, they change what your critical level is. For the nature of this conversation, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to say it's about 25. There's only a five part per million difference anyway. Okay, so 25 part per million is the critical level for the, unit, for, for the state of Illinois based upon their field experimentation here in the state. So 25, if you're below 25, are you guaranteed a yield loss? You're not guaranteed a yield loss. What are you risking, though, if you don't supply adequate P, let's say, and it's below 10? Up to 50% of your top end yield is gone because you have inadequate phosphorus supply. That's what you risk by not supplying phosphorus. And I have had growers in the state of Ohio who are willing to take that risk. Can you get away with it? You know what? Occasionally you can. But who's willing to risk 50% of top end yield gone because I didn't supply a nutrient that was required? Now, I'm going to actually, in a, in a subsequent slide, I'm going to put probabilities to this. So it's not just about the yield loss, it's what's the probability that I'm going to experience a yield loss? Okay, it's not that I lost the game, it's how many times am I, how many times am I likely to lose? So we have to think about this in two different ways. Soybeans look strangely similar. Below that 25, 25 part per million critical level, when you get soil test information, does it come to you in PPM or pounds per acre? I get it both ways. And the only reason I ask that question is, if you're getting it in pounds per acre, all you have to do is multiply this by two. So if 25 part per million is the critical level, that translates to 50 pounds per acre. Okay. Again, what are you risking? Again, the potential, that's a really bad one, 50%, but certainly up to 40% of your top end yield is gone because I didn't supply adequate nutrition. What does it look like for K? K is actually noisier. And again, it, when it, you understand what I shared with you earlier about how in dry situations, some of that K can get trapped. A lot of these yields, I can show you specifically for the state of Ohio, I won't 
I, w I don't dare bring in two sets of data from two different states. Okay, so I'm only going to show you Iowa. But my experience in Ohio, when I have dramatic yield losses and I have lost up to 40% of my yield by not having adequate K, or, excuse me, it lost up to 60%. I got 40% of maximum yield because I didn't supply adequate K. It was in that tough growing environment. When my yield potential for my corn was only 115 bushels. That's all I could grow. But by having adequate K, it took me from, that would have taken me from about 47 bushels to 115. That was a huge difference in that type of in a growing environment. But in the better years, when I get decent rainfall, get some drying and some wetting and some drying and wetting of that soil, there's a lot of potassium held there. It's a process we call weathering. If I get that kind of environment, which is conducive to very high yields, I can run into this situation where I don't see much of a response to potassium. But again, it's what are you risking by not supplying it? Anybody ever talk to you about fertilizer like a risk management game? That's really what it is. I'm not going to guarantee yield loss. I'm going to say there's a pretty good probability if you're below what they've established as critical. And again, this is in part per million. Does everybody know what? University of Illinois is actually a little bit higher than this. Okay. I'm actually, sorry, just a little bit lower than this. Right around 170 part per million. Now, these are cool graphs. I like scatter diagrams, but I'm a statistics junkie. Let's look at this in a more. Yes, sir. If you're looking at that like a risk management. Have you seen when you get them out of whack? Say you got really high P levels, yeah. and your K levels are just normal, which should be adequate. But are they really? Because is that extremely high P? Sure. Great question. The question was, if I get these way out of disproportion relative to each other. So I have really high P and, and so, so K. If both of them are above critical, and I'd like to see them not at critical, but a couple of part per million above, if they're above, you're going to be fine. Now, I have seen this, and it's, I haven't reported this in the literature because I haven't figured out a way to publish this. Let me make sure I get this right. If I have too much P, but my soil test K is low, below critical, I can actually show you yield declines by increasing P supply. Don't ask me what the physiological mechanism is. I haven't figured that out yet. But I have, for corn, I had 7 out of 12 sites that did that. And on beans, I had 3 out of 11. Again, I can't explain it. But if I have poor K, relatively good P, and I supply more P, I actually decline yield as my P rates go up. I don't see the same thing with potassium. So if I have low P and I have high K and I supply more K, I don't see a yield decline. But I can see that the other way around. Again, physiologically, tried to figure that out. I, I have no clue what's going on other than I've observed it. All right. So is it important? Yes, sir. Question. Sure. Use of VRT. If you've got access to the equipment, the approach makes sense. Uh, is it the most cost effective? We can argue about that all day long. <laughs> because everybody tries to figure out, do I need to have a one acre grid, two and a half acre grid, five acre grid, 10 acre grid? What's the right size grid? And you'll never see a university come out with a stone dead recommendation. And the reason is, What's the typical universe? I, I actually use it later, so I'm getting ahead of myself. It depends. Every field is different. If you have access to GPS and you're going to be doing spatial soil sampling, absolutely makes total sense to utilize that. Should you do it by grid or should you do it by zone? That's an argument we can have. Okay, because not every field is going to respond at the same resolution. I like zone because it makes sense, because I can base it on soil types. I can base it on crop removals based upon my calibrated, I always have to say that, my calibrated yield monitor to look at crop removals. And then I can come up and start drawing my, li my lines that make sense to me. When you start doing grid, you're sort of stuck in a box. I'm not saying it's good or bad. Okay? Not, not saying it's even worse because there are some situations where it's actually better. But I like zone because it, it's more intuitive to me. Okay? So let's put those ugly graphs in a form that's maybe a little more palatable. <laughs>
looking again at this is phosphorus, this is soil test range, this is basically the same data. If you're talking about a 200 bushel yield, if you're below nine part per million, you're jeopardizing 58 bushels. Okay, J again, just putting better numbers to that information from those previous slides. For soybeans, if you're talking about 60 bushel yield, you're jeopardizing 15 bushels. And at today's prices, <laughs> now again, don't ask me what next December is going to look like. I know what it is today. I know what December 13 looks like today. It's la I think yesterday it ended up around 5.30. It was trading as high as 5.75 just a couple of days ago. Okay, you, that's a lot of money to be made if you can lock in those kinds of prices. You're talking about 15 bushels at $16 beans. That's a lot of money left on the table. Corn for potassium, 200 bushel or 200 bushel yield level, you're risking 22 bushels. Phosphorus, 60 bushels, you're risking eight. All right, so this is what you risk if you have a low soil test and you don't supply adequate nutrition. Now again, it's not just how much are you risking, what's your probability of losing? If for phosphorus, this is again from Iowa State, just did some calculations, less than nine part per million, 80% probability you're gonna get a response if you supply fertilizer. It's only 20% probability that you're not. How many would go with me to Vegas with those odds? Man, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow if I can get these kinds of odds. The higher the soil test, what's the probability of response? It goes down. I'm, and I'm not going to say the, the opposite either. I would never say that you're above 25 part per million, you're not going to get a response to fertilizer. Guess what? I can show you the data where you do get responses to fertilizer. Okay, it's a probabilities game. For phosphorus, it doesn't do much. For potassium, it does influence where the critical levels lie. And essentially what they do is the higher the CEC, the higher the critical level. The higher the clay content, the higher the recommended amount of K you have in that soil. The lower the, the, the cation exchange, the lower the critical level. We do the same thing in Ohio. They do the same thing in Indiana and the same thing in, in Michigan. And it primarily has to do with that first slide I popped up about potassium, the diagram you have a greater possibility of, of capturing some of that K and getting it trapped when you have a higher clay content. All right. So for potassium, less than 90 part per million, again, 80% probability of a response to that K. Pretty good odds. This is what you manage when you're managing nutrient inputs. You're managing risk. Ensuring that I, based upon my soil test, I know what my P and K levels are. Man, if, if I know these are my probabilities, why not make the investment? Because the investment in all likelihood is going to pay out. The other thing about P and K, which makes it easier to manage, and I say that tongue firmly in cheek, easier to manage, none of this is easy to manage, is nitrogen. What happens to the nitrogen if you oversupply it? They complain about it in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, we can argue again about how much of what occurs in the hypoxic region is actually a result of corn production in, in Illinois, Iowa, Ohio, well, anywhere across the Midwest. And I've got some pretty compelling data, but I don't want to talk about that this morning. Okay? They, they end up complaining about it. The nitrogen you oversupply doesn't stick around. P and K, if I do happen to oversupply, like we did in the 60s and 70s, admittedly, nutrient inputs were a heck of a lot cheaper, made a lot more sense. By the way, we didn't have many environmental problems, but never mind. I'm not going to... We're not going to talk about that either. So I showed you the balance. Yes, sir, question. Uh, I've got a question. I noticed your data was a six inch soil sample. Correct. Some universities say six, some say seven, some say four for no till. Sure. How does that affect the, the numbers that you then, does that have a lot of effect on what P level you're looking for, K level you're looking for? <laughs> The question was, does depth of, of sampling, and it's really related to tillage like you, you, you mentioned, does the depth of sampling influence where these critical levels lie? The data that I've seen to this point hasn't shown me that for a no-till soil to a depth of four inches, I think the critical levels are still going to apply. Until someone has data to convince me otherwise, that's what, I, that's what the assumption I'm operating on. In Ohio, we're actually sort of an oddball. <laughs> Insert joke here. We sample to eight inches for all fields. If it's no-till, we want, still want you to sample to eight for P and K. They, they really love this, by the way. And then for pH management, you're only going to sample the top four. 
Yeah, again, that's, and that's what our growers do. <laughs> really? You want me to sample this twice? But it's fall, it's nice and cool, you should be happy to be out there, unless it's dry. So I showed you the balance, and this is actually where that, maybe I'll fix that for subsequent groups as they come through. 2007, 2008, this is from, from your state fertility specialist here at University of Illinois. 45% of Illinois fields checked were below critical potassium levels. Anybody read this this year? Because of the, the number of fields reporting potassium stress. 07, 08, 45%. Now, we ask a question, and again, it's not guaranteed that we're going to observe a yield loss. But based upon some statistics, I can do some calculations and figure out, man, if 45% of the fields are below the critical, how much yield are we leaving on the table? Okay, just, now, there's other individuals doing this kind of work. And this is, again, this is International Plant Nutrition Institute. You'll notice Illinois. So this is for soil test P, 39% below the critical level. For soil test K, 30%. This number has increased in the last decade. Does it match the balance data? And again, I'm, I, I am a scientist by training, so I, I never look at one piece of information to tell me what's going on. I always want to have corroborating information from other sources to make sure that what I'm providing is accurate, as, or as accurate as it can be. So we're seeing these kinds of declining soil test levels. Again, when you look at the balances, it makes sense. At some point, and again, it's just fortuitous that I happen to work for a company that produces that material. Okay, it, it really is that. Just kind of got tired of academia, which is a whole other conversation. Okay. If you're having a, if you're doing a tissue test and coming up deficient, mm -hmm. and then you want to try and correct that with a... Foliar application. Yeah. Darn it. I don't know if you can see these slides. I knew that question would come up. <laughs> Again, I was prepared one way, but I wasn't prepared technologically. Okay. Question was, what about foliar application of nutrients? Great question. Can they provide you a rescue application of a nutrient to get through you through? You can't really see this very well. Everything to the right. So this first one is actually based upon a soil application. I really hope the cameraman can get this. My suspicion is he can. Otherwise, he's going to be seeing faces, hairs on my faces, on my face that he doesn't want to see. Everything to the right is foliar application at different times. Ken did a very good job of introducing potassium or introducing soybeans and in in the way it grows. How much of the total K is accumulated after R4? After we've got three-quarter inch beans or pods on the top, one of the top four nodes. 40% of the total K is actually accumulated after that. So you would think that if I make a late season application of foliar K, I'm going to see a better response. Well, unfortunately, if you do have a K deficient situation, you're better off to target, say, at R1 as opposed to R4. I have my own suspicions as to why, and I, my suspicion is it has everything to do with foliar uptake of nutrients. What's the primary mechanism to get nutrients into a plant? The roots. I don't think you can force enough K through the foliage late in season to satisfy its nutritional needs. But if you do it at R1, some will get through the leaves. Some of it's going to be washed down to the, to the root system. So I think that's why the earlier shows you the better response. Okay. Uh, can you overcome deficiencies? You can make yield gains. All right. There's always an equivalent. There's always a, a, a comparison I can make. Should I do it foliar or should I supply it to the soil? Everything on, the, on the, your left is soil applied. Can I ever catch up with foliar? Okay. You can make, yield, you can make gains, but you're never going to catch up by if I just did a better job of soil sampling and supplying a, a broadcast application. Okay. And it has everything to do with how plants take up nutrients. You, so you can make foliar applications. You're not necessarily going to catch up if I had done a better job of just managing the input. Do you have a question? You, you have a word there that's quick interest in broadcast. Uh, or, or, there's, or there's strip till. It would be the same thing. You're gonna, you would see the same thing. Right. And it, in, in strip till, do you 
all those nutrients. You know, some guys are saying you can cut back. What guy comments there? I think you can cut back. I think some guys are way too aggressive on how much they claim you can cut back. Uh, I've heard is cutting back as much as 50%. The data that I've seen doesn't suggest to me that that's possible. At the most, and this is the good data, would be 25%. There are some gains to be made from an efficiency perspective by placement, but it's not, it's not 50%. Not the data that I've seen. Okay. All right, we've got eight minutes. What is the goal of fertilization? I, I do have a PhD. I do sit around and think about these things. <laughs> Maybe that makes me weird. Make your own judgments. What is your goal of fertilization? <laughs> Don't comment on my weirdness. <laughs> to uh, get more income and put into it. That's exactly correct. Now, we have to sort of table that because ultimately, I am an agronomist, so I do want to make sure that I have adequate nutrition, but I also want to see return on my investment. Okay? So your desire is to see economic benefit to the investment I make. Now I'm going to ask a question, because it's different. Are you thinking short term, or are you thinking long term? <laughs> Boy, that's a tricky question. And again, that's a real question. If you're <laughs> long term, right? It depends on whether it's your ground. Or I land. knew you were going to say that. Well, the darn rented ground argument. And that's a valid argument. You, you want to know my humble opinion? You want to know why our soil test levels have come down? Why we're not supplying as much fertilizer as yields go up? How many, how many acres of ground are rented in the state of Illinois? Cash rent. I've seen estimates. I don't know if it's real. 60%. Sound reliable? The sad part was when, when everybody started chasing cash rent, yeah. you sort of had it in the contract that you had to keep the facility up. People were milking the ground, not putting anything on it for That's, three years and then walk away. We can't come out as a company and make that statement because I'm going to alienate, alienate a lot of farmers. But that's exactly what happened. I completely agree with you. Is it rented ground or is it owned ground? Okay. So rented ground? If you're below the critical levels, what should be your approach? What's the probability of a return on investment the year of application? Below the critical level. Pretty darn good. Okay. It might affect my rate. I'm certainly not going to put on what I would consider a build-up rate of, of material, right? There's no economic incentive to do it. And again, I'm convinced that's what's primarily driving our balances down is because of the number of rented acres. I, and I don't blame you. I think we've been under accounting for what's going on in our rotations. I know I've seen it in Ohio with the farmers that I've worked with. If you're fertilizing a rotation, are you comfortable that you've got adequate P and K for that subsequent bean crop? Well, let's do some simple math and here's the univer typical university answer, right? It depends. What does it depend upon? Depends upon where your starting soil test level was. If you're well above critical, and this is really this is why I would never say that farmers back in the 60s, 70s, and maybe even some of you in this room, I will never say you're oversupplying fertilizer in those days. What would I, what would I call that? Pretty darn good investment <laughs> based upon where fertilizer prices have gone. That was a good long-term investment strategy. You're just collecting now the dividends on that investment. Okay? But realizing that every year the bank gets dwindled a little bit more. So if you start out with a really good soil test, what do you buy for yourself? This is why I, I never talk about over-fertilization because that's a, sort of an abstract concept. Because if you're over-fertilizing, what are you doing? You're buying a decision later. If I oversupply PK now, my soil test goes up, when, when fertilizer prices you like they did in 08, spike to $1,200 a ton for, for phosphate, $800, $900 a ton for potash, if your soil test level is high, what have you bought yourself? The option not to fertilize. Now, unfortunately, with where we're at today economically, I, I think you're losing those options be because of where fertility levels are going. Yes, sir? Yeah, one thing you didn't talk about, too, is the way to increase is to actually make sure your pH is where it should be. Yeah. And that's yeah. a pretty cheap way of actually supplying extra pH, too. I, 
I can never cover everything. Yeah. My analogy, and I'm, this is probably going to kill my time, the analogy for me is P and K are the, is phosphorus and potassium is the oil in the crankcase of your car. Okay, I can make several trips based upon where the crankcase level is through soil testing. I can make a lot of trips. I can produce a lot of crops and never have to put more oil into that crankcase. I had a 75 Ford back when I was a younger man. It burned as much oil as it did gas. So that analogy doesn't work for every car. Nitrogen is the fuel in the tank. Depending upon the length of my trip, the yield I can achieve, that's how much gas, how much nitrogen I need in the tank. pH is the air pressure of your tires. If your tires are flat because your pH is off, can I put enough oil in the crankcase or gas in the... Uh, in the tank to get me to my, de to my final destination. Okay. That's all I'm going to say about pH. <laughs> Depends upon, so if you're starting at a decent soil test level, yeah, you know what, I can produce 200 bushel corn. It's going to pull off, for, for every bushel I produce, it's going to pull off 0.37 pounds of phosphate, 0.27 pounds of potassium, so 200 bushels, 76 and 54 pounds respectively being removed. If I have a high enough soil test, I can do that. And my beans are going to have adequate nutrition. I can even do that with 250 bushel corn. 95 and 68. What if you start real close to the critical level and I don't supply enough P and K in my fertilization program to satisfy that bean crop as the second crop in the rotation? What do you suspect? How many of you have seen potassium stress in corn and then strangely enough the subsequent year you see potassium stress in your beans? Never seen that. I've seen it several times in the state of Ohio. Does it surprise me based upon when I ask them, what's your soil test? And they say, well, I don't know. Let's pull a soil test. Soil test reveals that K is low. If your, bean, if your corn is potassium stress, in all likelihood, the next crop is going to show the same stress. Okay. I'm not going to talk about this because I think I'm out of time. Again, this is that same illustration. This is the return. So back to your question. What's the goal of fertilization? If you're looking at short-term economic return, the lower your soil test, the greater the probability you're going to see payback on that investment. And this is with a moderate application rate. This is only assuming 46 pounds of P205. So we're not talking about a large application rate of phosphorus. Okay? This is not going to be enough to build up these low testing soils. This is essentially, I'm supplying enough to get me through this year. Sort of that rented ground mentality. And, and again, I'm, I'm not going to say that's not the right approach because you're looking at this from a short-term economic feasibility. Yes? Um, this is maybe too specific, but do you have uh, soil recommendations for uh, areas that are frequently stressed during the growing season, meaning that if your soil level is adequate, the plants may not be able to get enough anyway? <sighs> I can't speak to that for phosphorus. I can for potassium, and it was sort of like I talked about earlier. If it's drought stress, what is your primary stress? We Other things you can manage we have a, within reason. What I'd call a heat stroke in my area every year, pretty much. Okay. And uh, I've also, you know, we, we've noticed we, places that are over fertilized, they yield better. Sure. That might be a component. I don't know. There's probably other factors. Is there a benchmark that you've seen or kicked around for places like that? Physiologically, I can't figure out how that would help for P, for phosphorus. Potassium, it makes some sense. And it because it's based upon the fact that the plant's stressed. Usually what happens physiologically when it's stressed is nutrient supply is declining because the plant is sort of shutting down. Or it can't reach it. The soil's too dry. Because you're not pulling as much. But with potassium, if I can have greater amounts in the solution that's making it there, that illustration I shared earlier, during that stressful environment, I think in stressed environments there is an argument for having higher K. For P, it's harder for me to make that argument based upon the data I've seen to date. But for K, I think you can make that case. Any percentages you might throw around? Unfortunately, I don't have any good percentages that I could throw at you. Because I don't know how high above critical level you need to be. So if, if the critical level is 150, 170, if I'm prone to stress, does it need to be 190 or 210? I, I don't have a good number. It's a great question. Unfortunately, I can't answer it. All right, guys, we're officially out of time. We, are. we really blew through those last few slides. <laughs> I appreciate your attention this morning. Hopefully you learned something.
Uh, some of it I know was a rehash, but I appreciate your time. Hopefully this drought will break and we'll have a fall. <laughs> Not real sure at this point if it's ever going to rain again in the state of Illinois. It does in Chicago, apparently. That's, that's happened before, hasn't it? Never did rain again. <laughs> we have a history of that. That's right. <laughs> Let's thank Dr. Thank you.